Good morning, everybody. It is good to be back. So uh, this week, because I wasn't here last week, but last week was actually music with the minister, but uh, Mike continued on in a series um, of the uh, core series last week. So we're going to do a music with the minister today, even though it's a second Sunday, because it is the Christmas season and we have to listen to a Christmas song. So as you know of me, all I listen to is Christmas music for the entire the, uh, five o'clock on Thanksgiving Day until the end of Christmas Day is only Christmas music. It's all you can have in your life, nothing else. And then you're bored of it by Christmas and you're ready for the regular music. And then you come back next year with anticipation waiting for it. So anyways, we are doing a Christmas song today. Uh, and then we will walk through the lyrics of the song and kind of tell the story that the song is telling and put some biblical passages with it. Today we're going to listen to Light of the World uh, by Lauren Daigle. This one's been out for a while, so it's kind of like almost a traditional one now. Uh, but we're going to listen to her song, so we're going to watch the video, and then I will come back up and we will talk about this Christmas song. So go ahead, Chuck.
right, so that is Lauren Daigle, Light of the World. And so what we're going to do now is just kind of walk through the theme of that song, the message of that song, um, and kind of just take it uh, bit by bit and apply it to our lives today. So uh, the first part of the song, the first lyrics in it, is kind of an adult response to living in this broken world, this fallen world that we live in, and kind of how they view it. And um, as I was thinking about that, you just look in the newspaper and you watch the news, on a regular basis, and there's no way that you can debate that this world is completely broken. Um, just two weeks ago, and the, the more news came out this week, how many of you saw the story of that FedEx worker with that whole story? So you have a FedEx worker, and they've now arrested him and found him, um, and he claims he actually backed over a seven-year-old with his truck, and then he went back, and she wasn't hurt too bad, but he's afraid she was gonna tell her parents. So he loaded her in a truck, and then went away, I don't think we have kids in here, right? That's, I made sure I got all the kids out here. And then went away and strangled her, and then disposed of her body. I don't know how you don't look at that, and we see, that's not even odd, that's horrible, but it's, it's a world we live in. Um, but we see this stuff on a regular basis. So the first part of the song is this, this, the world waits for a miracle, the heart longs for a little bit of hope, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Okay, um, this is a same desire we have throughout history because all of us that live in this broken world and this destroyed world that we're in, um, because of sin that's involved in it, we all desire just to see some type of a miracle, um, some type of a miracle, something good, something that gives us hope that we can cling on to in the midst of all this horrible stuff that happens around us. And so the first part of the song just kind of brings that out and just says, Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. And what happens is this, is we know 700 years before the birth of Jesus, his birth is foretold in the book of Isaiah. Um, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it says this, All right then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That 700 years before Jesus actually was born onto this earth. Okay, We have that prophecy in Isaiah. Now, next part of the lyrics of the song, it kind of takes the same thing, which is the pain, the hurt, the ugliness of this world, but it, it talks about through the eyes of a child and kind of how their perspective on things is. And this is another one that's kind of interesting. We see this firsthand on Wednesday nights with the kids that we get, especially the kids we get down from the meadows at the apartment complex, is when you ask them questions, you anticipate getting like normal answers back. But like this last week or whatever, we were asking like, you know how bad stuff happens in life and like people treat people bad and stuff like that. And one kid, one kid looks at me and goes, yeah, like when people stab each other, I'm like, yes, when people like stab each other. And then the other kid's like, yeah, when people are shooting each other, like in the apartments. And I'm like, yes, that type of stuff too. And it's like, these are kids who are third, fourth grade. And this is just part of their mindset. This is what they're seeing constantly. This is a the world they live in. And the lyrics say this, it says, a child prays for peace on earth, and she's calling out from a sea of hurt, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Okay? Because here's what happens. Kids don't understand the hurt and the pain in this world and why it's happening. I think all kids actually get an idea is, is that when they see the hurt and the pain and they see the ugliness of this world, they just know something's not right. They instinctively at the core know something isn't right because they're still innocent and they know this isn't right. This is, isn't how it's supposed to be. And all a kid can do is just pray for peace, that God would bring peace to the earth, that somehow peace will be brought to their lives. And that's what the song kind of points out as a girl praying for peace on earth due to the hurt she's seen in this world. The next thing it says is this. It says, and you can hear the angels singing, glory to the light of the world, glory, the light of the world is here. And so now you get into the Christmas theme, that Emmanuel, Jesus, the light of the world is about to come into this world. He's about to arrive on this planet. Uh, we see an account of this in Luke chapter 2 with the shepherds. So as Jesus' parents, Mary and um, uh, Joseph, are in Bethlehem, I almost forgot that that would be bad, being the guy who says he cares about Christmas. Uh, as Mary and Joseph are in Bethlehem, an angel appears to the shepherds. And here's the account. It says this. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. Then they were terrified, but the angel assured them, Don't be afraid, he said. 
I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased. Okay? So now you get into the Christmas theme that Jesus has arrived, and he is the one that brings peace to this world. Now the next part of the song says this, the drought breaks. And what it's um, implying here by the drought breaks, it's the drought of having no answers, no solutions, no hope. Um, and it's hard for us to comprehend as Christians, but think what it would be like before Christ. Before you had hope, before you had solutions, before you had an eternal perspective on things and knowing the full story. And all you have is a prophecy that someday God is going to come and he's going to fix this. And someday someone's going to be born that's going to fix this world. It's going to fix the problems with this world. Um, and that's kind of what it's saying, the drought breaks. Jesus arrives and that drought of no hope, no answers, no solutions is about to end because Jesus is going to be born. And he is, his birth is the second greatest act of love us humans will ever know. Okay? The first is the fact that he died, but the, the second one is that he actually came here. So let me take a second just to explain that. We often overlook this at Christmas because we're so used to the story and it's Jesus' birth and they went to the manger and he was born in a manger and all that stuff. Here's the amazing part of all that. That's a storytelling. The amazing part is, is the guy who created everything loved us enough to go, you're so broken and you so rejected me and you've so destroyed everything I created. I got to fix it. And the only way I can fix it is I have to come be with you. And I have to be one of you. And so the creator of everything, it's just picture this, the creator of everything became a human so he could save us. He left the place we all want to get to, heaven, to come here to be among us, voluntarily do that when he had no reason to. He had, he had no demands to. He could do whatever he wanted, but yet he came here and he was born into this world with all the issues that we had that we have to deal with all the time. He had to be a baby. Can you imagine being God and living with our baby bodies? Honestly, can you think about it? Let me just, I, we, I know it's funny, but think of this. The creator of the universe let us wipe his butt and clean up his messes. That's stunning. Stunning. And that's what happened. When Hebrews 2, it confirms this for us. In verse 14, it says, Because God's children are human beings, which is us, made of flesh and blood, the Son, Jesus, also became flesh and blood. For only a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of death who had the power, or could break the power of the devil who had the power of death. So we're confirmed there that God went, the only way I can save you is I have to become one of you. And then after becoming one of you, I have to let you kill me. That is the only way I could save you. Uh, and as confirmed in Hebrews 2, the song moves on and says this, he is the song for the suffering. Um, so why do we listen to songs? Typically, why we listen to songs is they encourage us at times. Um, they inspire us. They give us hope. More than just talking with people, somehow songs with music and all behind them have a way of just inspiring us and providing us hope. Um, and this is what Jesus does to those who are suffering. His birth encourages, inspires, and gives hope to the suffering. And so that's what the song's kind of pointing out here is he is a song for the suffering. He is Messiah. The Prince of Peace has come. He has come, Emmanuel. Okay? Now, Messiah here, that's the same word. It just means Savior. Savior of the world. The Jewish people were waiting for the Messiah. They were waiting for the Savior to come fix the world, the problem the world had of how they had broken their relationship with God. So Messiah means Savior, the one who can bring peace between God and man. Okay, the one that can provide that peace. In Romans 5, verses 1 through 2, it says this, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege 
where we now stand and we can confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Um, and what that verse was telling us is this, because of what Jesus did for us, we no longer have to view God as an opposing figure, someone that we're scared of. It's someone that we can have confidence before and joyfully look forward to standing before someday because we know that our sins will never be held to account to us, that Jesus took them from us and we will never have to answer for them and we will just be embraced by our creator, okay? So we can have confidence and we can joyfully look forward to that day that we stand before God because of what Jesus did. Then the song does this, and I think there's two times in the song it goes through this. It says, glory to the light of the world, glory to the light of the world, glory to the light of the world, glory to the light of the world. And it's this concept of giving glory to someone. And what that means is you show appreciation for what they've done. And the song repeats this four times over and over. And I think the reason it does that is to create like a reverence or an awe for who Jesus is and what he's done for us. To connect it back to that part of the song of realizing the king of the universe came here and became us. And that is something for us to have reverence for and something for us to stand in awe of, going, I, it's hard to even comprehend that. And I'm standing in awe of that. Now, it brings up this concept of glory and uh, bringing glory to God. And so I want to hit on here is this, ways that we bring glory to God. Because I think the word glory, is a, it's an odd term. It's a term we don't fully understand. But the scriptures do flesh this out quite a bit to help you understand how you as an individual can bring glory to God. Um, and I just want to give you four different passages. Uh, the first one's going to point out one of the ways you can bring glory to God is by pointing other people to Jesus. That's one of the ways you respect him, you honor him, you bring glory to him as you point other people to Jesus. In Romans 1, verse 5, it says, Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and the authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. So the apostles are going, we get this privilege to go out there and point people to Jesus. We could go tell the Gentiles that God has resolved this issue between them and him and their sin issue. God has fixed it. And they're going, we get this privilege, and if we point people to God and they start praising God, that brings glory to God. The apostles are not around anymore, but we still continue that work. As we get the privilege, it's not a burden, it's not an embarrassment. It's a privilege. We get to actually tell people what God has done for them, that God loves them, what God has offered them, that God was willing to forgive them and offer them grace, and God wants to have a relationship with them. That's a privilege we get to have in this world for people who do not know him, okay? And by doing that, we bring glory to God. Another way that we bring glory to God is through right living, which is living the way that God would call us to live. I got three scriptures that kind of uh, talk about this. The first one's from Romans 6. It says, Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have a new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for what? For the glory of God to use your whole body, to use the actions that you have, the words that you say, everything about you to bring glory to God on a daily basis as you have right living in your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 31, it says this, So whatever you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So everything you're doing in your life, you're doing it to glorify God. You're doing it to please Him and show Him appreciation for what He's done for you. Everything you do is a response of glory to him, to bring him glory as a thankfulness for what he's done for you. In Philippians 1.11, it says this, May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. And what this is implying here is you don't transform yourself. God transforms you if you let him. Okay? That the Spirit will transform you. He will produce character in you, righteous character, uh, by Jesus working in your life. And through that, if you allow the Spirit to develop you and transform you into the person God desires, you bring glory and you bring praise to God. So the way we bring glory to God is through right living. By pointing people to Jesus, we glorify God. Therefore, you can take this on the opposite side. If you don't have right living, if you're afraid to point people to Jesus, you're not glorifying God. You're not showing appreciation for what he's done for you. Um, you're just keeping it to yourself. And he's going, no, 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 we, we just are naturally, we understand what God has done for us. We naturally want to glorify him. Just like the apostles, just like all the Christians throughout history, 
you naturally have this desire to glorify him in this world. The song goes on, it says this, for all who wait, um, I just interpret this, all who are waiting for God's answers, for God's timing, rather than taking things into their own hands and doing things themselves, but those who are willing to wait for God's timing and his answers, for all who hunger, for those who hunger for the presence of God in their lives, for all who have prayed, so those who have uh, prayed for answers from God and asked for salvation from their sins and forgiveness for their sins, for all who wonder, um, and what I take that as is those who wonder, is God here? Does God care? Um, for all those people, it says, behold the King, behold Messiah, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. The point here is this. Jesus is the answer to every one of the questions that we have in life. Does God love me? Does God care about me? Does God have a plan for me? Can God save me in spite of everything that I've done in my life? Uh, Jesus' birth, life, and resurrection provide a verifiable answer of yes to every one of those questions. Does God love you? Yeah, he does. He left heaven to come here to die for you. He loves you. Does God care about you? Um, yeah. Um, if he values you that much, obviously he cares for you. Obviously he wants to take care of you and he wants what's best for you. Does God have a plan for me? Yes. We read the scriptures and we see what Jesus modeled and what Jesus taught. It was all about, here's the life I want you to live and here's your purpose in this life. Can God save me? Absolutely. You know why? Because he died as a criminal. So no matter what sin you committed, he already took the punishment for it. He was crucified for it. So no matter how bad you think your sin is and you go, God can't forgive that one. He can forgive all these. He can't forgive that one. Well, he was crucified for it. He took the punishment. He took the worst punishment that you could take in order to forgive the worst sins that we can commit. Okay? So can God save you? Absolutely. Um, Jesus is the answer for all those verifies that yes is the answer to every one of those questions. Then the song ends with this. It says, the world waits for a miracle. The heart longs for a little bit of hope. Oh, come, oh, come. Emmanuel. It ends the same way it began. That is the first lines of the song. It's the last lines of the song. And here's what I would say about it is this. You are the light of the world. Um, if you are a person that sits in here right now and you consider yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. You are the hands and feet of Jesus in this broken world in which we live. So on Wednesday nights, those of us that work with these kids, we understand we are the light of the world. We are the hands and feet of Jesus when we were in there. Uh, two weeks ago, we started teaching on Christmas with these kids. We had 10 of them in there. Five of them, no clue this year what Christmas was. They knew it was gifts. No clue of any connection whatsoever to Jesus Christ, anything to do with them. Didn't know it was religious. Didn't know it had anything to do with Jesus, God. Ain't. All they knew is it was gifts. That's it. Okay, I was kind of taken back, so I'm going, these kids aren't even like they don't know the whole Christmas story. These kids don't even know the Christmas story is connected to the Christmas in any way, shape, or form. Okay? We are the hands and feet of Jesus. We are the light of the world. We are the miracle because if we have been transformed, other people can see the miraculous things God has done in our life, and we are a miracle to them that God can transform them as well. We are the hope that there is something better. We are the ones that can communicate this world is not our home. This is not the end. This is not the end of the story. There is something better. There is a place where there's no more tears, no more hurt, no more pain, no more sorrow, that someday perfection will be restored, and we can be a part of that. We are that hope. We are Emmanuel. Uh, meaning God is with us because God's spirit lives within us. And so therefore, through us, God is with us. God is with them. They are in the presence of God when they're in the presence of his followers because his spirit lives within us. And God is right there to speak to them and encourage them and say the words they need to hear through us. God uses us to be with them that way. This Christmas season, make sure that you are the miracle. Make sure you are the hope. And make sure that you are the reflection of Jesus this world desperately needs to see. We don't live in the world that we lived in once long ago. We live in a world that's totally transformed around us, that desperately needs hope, that desperately needs answers, that desperately know, needs to know that there is something that has a greater plan than just making it through this life and trying to find some brief moments of happiness amongst all the disaster. We need to make sure that we are representing Jesus to this world, especially during this time of Christmas when we have the microphone that people are willing to listen to. 
Would you pray with me? Awesome.